and because we have got a crack on then I'll just um, now introduce one of, well, the first of our three keynotes. Um, and um, the, this is the easy part of the job, really, because these, all of our keynotes are so well known. It's not a lot I can, I can tell you that you don't already know about them. But I will just say a, a few words. I mean, Robert, um, I, I have had the pleasure of working with, with Professor McCruer for more than, more than a decade now. And he's certainly advised me um, um, very productively along the way, even about uh, when, when ideas of the centre were just coming, you know, before I arrived at this university, um, chatting about that as a possibility. Um, and obviously, as I talked to you this morning about the journal, Robert's input there has been uh, sustained. Um, and, um, and then the, the, the new uh, dis uh, um, history project, uh, Cultural History of Disability, um, uh, obviously, Robert's uh, central to that. Um, so, you know, the, the work is done in engaging with the CCDS as, as, as significant. Um, and of course, uh, many of you all, all would already know Robert for his, uh, most obviously, I think, um, is his 2006 work, um, which really is an exemplary model when it comes to intersectionality. That's how I would think of it. And, and it's, again, as I talked this morning, it's one of those works that crosses uh, m many disciplinary uh, boundaries, as it were, um, and, and I guess that's one of the things. And the other thing that I must mention is, is the crypt epistemology um, double issue that was mentioned this morning, but that has been um, has had so much attention, and, and I think has made such a, a, an impact um, in, in the field that I I know of. And of course, um, Professor McCrew is very much an international scholar. is is known around the world. As I say, there's not a lot I, I can tell you that you don't know about him. So if, if we can just welcome, and and then we'll crack on. There's an unopened water here that I guess is mine. <laughs> yes. We'll see if. It <laughs> Thank you so much, David, and I'm really happy to be here and, and, and grateful to Claire and David and Owen and everybody here at Liverpool Hope that may have had any part of putting together this great event. Um, I have a lot of images in this talk that I will describe as I, as I move through them, um, and there are several different places where I could stop. And so we'll just sort of, s I'll keep an eye on the clock so that we have some time to talk near half past five uh, or right before half past five. Um, I think the title of the talk that I gave is Crypt Times Disability Politics in a Post-Truth Era. That is fine. Uh, it's very close to the title of my forthcoming book. Um, which is on the screen right now. So um, this is the cover of Crypt Times, Disability, Globalization, and Resistance. It shows Crypt Times in big black letters and the subtitle uh, a bit smaller. Uh, and then in the, in the background behind the title and my name uh, are basically about 10, 12 shelves of small clay figures um, that were sculpted out of river mud um, by the Bristol-based artist Liz Crow. Um, and I, I will mention that performance piece and sculpture piece a bit later in the talk. So in many ways this talk is kind of an overview of a lot of the things that this book does. Um, it is currently in production, finally, uh, at New York University Press. Uh, and will be coming out this year uh, in December um, in the new series at NYU that, uh, even, um, that's called CRIP, New Directions in Disability Studies, uh, not to be confused with Corporealities, the other amazing uh, series edited by a George Washington University <laughs> professor, my, my colleague uh, David and Sharon, uh, who are here today. Um, this book uh, reaches around the globe. Uh, in fact, I, I, before I get started, I want to spotlight one thing that I mentioned in the intro uh, because uh, Eva Eggerman is here somewhere uh, and she will be giving a presentation tomorrow on, on Crip Magazine, uh, which comes out of Vienna, uh, which um, this is the second issue of Crip Magazine. So if you are looking for an edgy, interesting panel to go to tomorrow, I would highly recommend seeing that. 
Um, the book uh, goes from Spain to Mexico, Chile, the US, Greece, and other locations, uh, and brings a crypt theory perspective to a globalized austerity politics. Uh, the UK, as many of you probably know, uh, and as Margaret Childrick, uh, Dan Goodley, and, and many others have written about, has constructed one of the most punishing austerity agendas in the world. So although the book does attend to all of the locations that uh, I just mentioned and spinning out uh, constantly, it retains a focus on, on the UK in many ways. Um, in many ways as well, although the chapters in Crypt Times have a lot of different layers, uh, my theses are, uh, are relatively straightforward and I hope consistent across the cultural locations of disability I survey in the book. Um, so I'm going to give you the theses in a nutshell. Disability, um, I suggest, is one of the under-theorized central issues of a now global austerity politics. Uh, and the book uh, surveys, at this point, the ways that disability artists and activists <clears throat> are responding to what I call crypt times uh, and contends that uh, artists and activists are themselves putting forward that thesis about disability's centrality uh, and that in, in some locations their demand for disability justice is starting to register. And I'll just give you uh, an example, a, a somewhat unusual example that I'll texture a little bit later in the talk. This is an image from Chile from uh, 2011. Uh, this is a photo of um, the student movement in Chile, which was uh, and remains an incredibly vibrant student movement. Um, some of you know there, there is a speaker here. For, uh, there she is from Chile. <laughs> uh, Chilean uh, higher education is the second most expensive education in the Western Hemisphere um, after, guess who, uh, the US. <laughs> um, and uh, it has also been um, not only expensive but stratified uh, and at the time of what was called the Chilean winter uh, in 2011, um, uh, Sebastian Piñera, the, the right-wing uh, president at the time, uh, was seeking to raise fees uh, and thus stratify higher education even more. So a vibrant student movement broke out and this is one of the protests in Santiago. Uh, that shows just a bunch of young people marching uh, with banners, uh, most likely to Plaza Italia in, in Santiago. Um, but in the forefront of the image, um, there are several students um, in wheelchairs uh, that are uh, being pushed with numbers held in their laps. Um, these are numbers for the days that they have been on hunger strike. Um, and uh, the students in wheelchairs are using uh, masks uh, and uh, several of the people who are also uh, marching are also using masks. It's not clear um, how many students are or were on hunger strike at the time of this photo, um, but uh, as the movement uh, amplified over the course of the winter of 2011, um, several students took their protest to a higher level uh, and, and went on a hunger strike uh, protesting uh, Chilean higher education and demanding that it be free and accessible to all. I'm sort of interested, uh, this is I know an unusual image to put forward as a, as a disability image, but it nonetheless clearly is one. Um, I'm interested in the ways that actually the face that became representative of the Chilean student movement that year is in some ways the inverse of this. Um, so at the time, Camila Vallejo was the sort of globally recognized uh, leader of the movement, uh, and her image uh, is on the screen before you. There are many. There's not one single image that was iconic during that year. Uh, she is young, uh, brown hair, uh, wears a sort of signature uh, uh, nose ring, has a red scarf here, and her arm raised. Um, and what's interesting to me uh, in the part of the book where I talk about the hunger strikers uh, and Chile uh, is the ways that the movement actually was represented by health, youth, able-bodiedness, vigor, sort of globally, but nonetheless was haunted by sort of crip images that were not actually disseminated so much 
uh, globally uh, as Vallejo's image was. Um, so I'm going to come back to uh, Chile in, in a moment, but this is just to sort of uh, illustrate the first part of the thesis that I wanted to share with you, which is that um, demands for justice uh, are being recognized in a range of locations uh, around the world uh, in relation, sometimes obliquely, uh, to disability. But that demand for, for justice exists at, at a moment, uh, our neoliberal moment, um, that simultaneously, as never before, uh, positions uh, disability as a niche, an identity, even a market that's potentially quite useful uh, to the guardians of austerity politics. Um, the image before you on the screen, many of you will recognize now, is an image from uh, the 2012 Paralympics. And it's basically recognizable as a, a, a politician's photo op. You have two Paralympians on a tennis court in wheelchairs who are actually obscured by a handshake between the former Prime Minister David Cameron uh, and at the time the Mayor of London, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, who, are, who are shaking hands. Uh, the photo's obviously all about them and not the Paralympians, um, but my point is to uh, this is in many ways what um, my colleagues David and Sharon would call inclusionism. Um, my point here is that the flip side of the recognition of disability justice and the need for disability justice in a moment of globalized austerity uh, is countered by this sort of dangerous uh, usefulness uh, of disability that coexists with it. Uh, in that situation, in that dangerous situation, um, disability, I would say, as a queer theorist, has some circumscribed potential uh, to go the way of a globalized, commodified queerness, even if I would actually maintain that disability and crip retain in our moment a certain critical possibility or promise that is not always palpable anymore or as much around queer. Finally, the, the path that Cripping takes, uh, the, that is the ways in which disability pivots in this dangerous moment, uh, this is the final element of the thesis, is wrapped up in affect, uh, or rather a vacillation between the politics of affect, which is deployed quite effectively, in, including in, in photos like this uh, photo op with Cameron and Johnson, uh, deployed quite effectively by state and capital to sustain the class strategy of austerity and the other side of it, a, what Jasper K. Puar and others have theorized as an affective politics. Deborah Gould, uh, in an incredibly important book on HIV activism called Moving Politics, um, I, I think she's actually much better on affect than Puar. I don't know if uh, there are some rooms where that would be uh, heresy to say that, um, but I think that Gould uh, is better on affect than Puar, and she uses, I'll give you a quote from her, the term affect to, quote, indicate non-conscious and unnamed but nevertheless registered experiences of bodily energy and intensity that arise in response to stimuli impinging on the body, unquote. Affect in social movements is discernible, I argue, in crypt times uh, in and through various forms of excessive and flamboyant uh, activist and artistic uh, crypt resistance. So I'm going to talk about some of the central topics of um, Crypt Times momentarily uh, before uh, pivoting more decisively to some of the dangers in what I termed a, a, a post-truth moment or what others have termed a post-truth moment. Um, a lot of this talk will actually be a meditation on the, the vicissitudes of the keyword resistance uh, in, in disability theory, in queer theory, in, in activist thought at the moment. Um, so even though I'm going to survey a number of topics in, in what follows here, um, the, this talk is unified around that uh, long-term work now uh, on resistance. Um, resistance is in the subtitle to my book uh, and actually um, one of the, the chapters uh, thickly examines its history and, and ongoing life as a key word. Um, particularly uh, in conversation with queer of color theory but back to Chile, to get you to this meditation on resistance, back to Chile. Formerly, I, I put those two images before you, one dominant, arguably globally disseminated, of Vallejo, uh, one sort of in the margins of that moment in 2011, 
Uh, I want to begin with another image uh, from a few years later um, that is an example of what Franz Fanon, uh, who was working with wounded soldiers, of course, during the Algerian Revolution, uh, this is an example of what Franz Fanon might understand as heroic resistance. Um, so let me quickly describe what's on the screen and then I'll contextualize it for you. The photo on the screen now shows um, a bearded young man with a red scarf wrapped around his head. Um, he's in a hospital room, um, but you won't know that until I give you the fuller story. Uh, the Chilean flag that he's holding up says, Renderse Hamas, uh, never surrender. Uh, and the Chilean flag is red, white, and blue, uh, not like the US flag. Uh, it's divided into three parts, uh, white on the right, blue on the, the left with one star, and, and red on the bottom. Um, so I'm putting this before you as an example of what Franz Fanon might call heroic resistance. Um, this is actually, uh, in contrast to the hunger strikers, which could be seen as, well, is that exactly a disability image or not? Uh, this is actually decidedly a disability image that two years ago became temporarily representative of the ongoing uh, Chilean student movement demanding free and accessible uh, education for all. On May 21st, 2015, Rodrigo Aviles was participating in a protest uh, in the coastal city of Valparaiso uh, when water cannons moved in to disperse the students. Uh, the police were caught on video um, pointing the cannon at very close range at Aviles uh, as he moved with a group of activists down the sidewalk. Um, as a result of what happened, he suffered a severe injury to the head uh, when he was thrust to the pavement. The incident re resulted in, in neurological damage to the right side of the brain, uh, and, and a coma was induced to save Aviles's life. Over the course of that winter, this is the winter of 2015, uh, Aviles underwent surgeries and began a long process of rehabilitation, uh, details of which were, were widely available in the, the Chilean media. Not necessarily globally, but widely available in the, the Chilean uh, media. And, and actually, the uh, surgeries to deal with ongoing um, issues connected to convulsions and other things, uh, surgeries uh, have continued for Aviles uh, to this year, uh, and even as he himself continues to be an activist. Um, outside the hospital uh, and across the country and across social media, uh, the movement began to, to coalesce around Aviles's image and story. So interestingly, uh, even though, as I said, there was no one iconic image of uh, Camila Vallejo, for a time, this particular photo with the Rendirse Hamas flag did become uh, an iconic, iconic image uh, of him. This um, was a photo that uh, is from the day he was released from the hospital on July 21st. Uh, again, a red scarf around his head. Uh, he's depicted standing in his hospital room uh, with the words, never surrender, uh, written in front of him. Um, off to the side, this is really just sort of off to the side. Amazingly, uh, these tactics did not stop. <laughs> Uh, in Chile, one would think that um, sort of police water cannons uh, putting an activist into a coma that is widely reported on uh, with witnesses on video describing what happened, uh, one would think that police violence of that sort would stop. This was uh, a week late, a week and a half about later, uh, an image that's on the screen now that I took myself. Um, I arrived in Santiago uh, about a week after this happened. Um, you see a street where a student protest was in process and uh, students are sort of standing around uh, as part of that protest and in the, um, there are trees um, with leaves falling because it's, it's sort of winter uh, and in the back water cannons have suddenly started advancing again uh, on the students and in fact they all had to run and, and I had to run as well uh, because of that uh, tactic that did not stop uh, even though uh, Aviles was in a coma at the time. So um, it may already be clear uh, but the, the book 
Crip Times examines a, a range of disability activisms connected in various ways to that, that year of hope, <laughs> promise, uh, and disappointment, 2011. So I'm kind of giving you this quick survey of Chile because it's one nodal point uh, in, in an amazing year that it's kind of hard to remember that we're not that far away from. 2016 was such a horrendous year for the entire globe uh, that you sort of think, oh yeah, just uh, uh, five years before that uh, was uh, the Chilean student movement and related student movements in Quebec and Mexico, the Arab Spring, Los Indignados in Spain, Occupy Wall Street uh, across America. And I, I was sort of thinking this morning as uh, David was uh, narrating the history of this conference, it's kind of nice, poetic, that the first one was in 2011. Uh, and uh, has been happening uh, every two years since then. Um, but th things look a lot bleaker uh, in 2017, sadly, than they did in 2011, uh, except perhaps uh, here in, in the UK where we can hope that things are starting to turn uh, against austerity. Um, in in uh, addition to activism, the book uh, examines disability or crip art, broadly, broadly understood. And I'm just going to give you the two main artists that I talk about in Crip Time. Uh, the, the first I've already mentioned, uh, and the image on the screen now has an extreme close-up of one of Liz Crow's uh, sculptures made out of river mud um, that is just depicted on a rocky shore. Um, the sculpture is uh, a small, maybe, maybe eight to ten, I'm not sure how centimeters work, so Liz told me what it was in centimeters, and now it slipped my mind. Uh, it's about a foot tall, uh, and um, has a sort of bulbous part at the top where two eyes uh, suggest a head, but it's actually basically an abstract human figure. So one chapter focuses on this mass sculptural uh, performance piece called Figures, where Liz Crow, over a period of two weeks in 2015, sculpted on the banks of the Thames at high and low tide, 650 figures from raw river mud, each one representing someone living life or dying at the sharp end of austerity. Uh, the other artists, uh, I'm happy to talk more about why these two artists are so important to me. Um, the other artist I focus on uh, is a photographer by the name of Livia Radwanski, who is based in, in Mexico City. Um, and the image on the screen now is one of her photos that I actually talked about the last time I was at Liverpool Hope University. Um, the image just shows a tattered sofa with a Spider-Man quilt thrown on it uh, in a dingy room. Um, there are cracked uh, plaster on the wall behind the yellow sofa, or sectional perhaps, it's missing one arm. Um, there are sort of faded and, and cracked shutters uh, al alongside the edge of the sofa. Um, so this other chapter um, focuses on uh, Radwanski, who was part of a global project called El Museo de los Desplazados, the Museum of the Despla Displaced, which has had more than 75 installations uh, around the world connected to a specific project called Gentrification No Es Un Nombre de Señora, Gentrifica Gentrification Is Not a Lady's Name. Um, and my work in particular with this photographer, Livia Radwanski, um, uh, who documented the shifting landscape of and, and displacements in uh, the Colonia Roma neighborhood of Mexico City, uh, Adam, um, my work with her is connected to the larger project of Crip Times uh, because she was making this particular documentation of gentrification in Mexico City at the precise moment that the British government was happily exporting its vision of so-called accessibility to its Mexican trading partners. So um, the chapter on Radwanski um, focuses on housing crises both in the UK and in Mexico that are covered over again uh, by sort of uh, happy family multiculturalism uh, that, that Britain was exporting uh, uh, through photo ops and events in, in Mexico City. So that's the sort of survey of, of all the things that this book does. Um, but over the past several months, I've been thinking about art and activism 
particularly the art and activism that this book surveys in a completely new context. Uh, and now I'm going to sort of move into the part on resistance to convey that. And I'm going to use two slides to convey that, that context of the past several months. Um, the first is another of Liz Crow's projects um, that is before you on the screen but is also in, described in the text as I read it, so uh, let me just do that. Um, another of Liz Crow's uh, projects that ran from 2013 until 2015 was uh, also a performance piece of sorts that was called In Actual Fact. In actual fact, or, or hashtag in actual fact, depending on where you read about it, uh, mobilized mass tweets like the ones that's on the screen before you that were intended to counter the ongoing campaign of misinformation or disinformation emanating from the British establishment and from David Cameron's administration in particular. So a tweet in the installation such as the one that um, I'll read here, uh, might begin, for example, with, quote, as you see on the screen, public believe benefit fraud at least 27%, and then go on to counter that belief with information on record. Um, so DWP, the Department of Works and Pensions, own statistics say 0.7, and then every tweet would end with the hashtag in actual fact. Um, I'll give you another example, not putting it before you, uh, another uh, tweet from the project said, uh, uh, DLA, Disability Living Allowance to PIP, Personal Independence Payment, government to cut 20% 20 20 of claimants, 500,000 disabled people's independence on the line, hashtag in actual fact. In actual fact was invitational, calling on the public uh, both to retweet the correctives um, put forward by the campaign itself and to create their own. Uh, each tweet was verified through a source and, and the slightly more than two year project was ultimately archived online with the intention being that it could serve as a lasting database in opposition to government, to this is a quote from Liz Crow, in, in opposition to government and press propaganda about the cuts and benefit claims that continues to skew public opinion toward division and hatred. It's a really great project, like everything that Crow does. But with a sinking feeling over the past nine months, I've been thinking about in actual fact alongside things like this that I will describe. Um, this is one of Donald Trump's most notorious tweets, and so on the screen is just a screenshot of a Donald J. Trump tweet uh, that reads, in addition to winning the Electoral College in a landslide, I won the popular vote if you deduct the millions of people who voted illegally. Um, this is just one of uh, dozens and dozens that he has tweeted since. Um, to do a sort of crow-like moment for you. Hillary Clinton actually won the US popular vote uh, by more than two million. Trump's assertion has absolutely no basis in fact. It was in fact quickly and widely denounced and yet neither its truthfulness uh, nor the denunciation seem to matter. Um, as many of you know, Oxford Dictionaries has an actual fact named post-truth word of the year for 2016. Uh, and the, the Spanish Academy has recently uh, added it to the, the official uh, Spanish dictionary, uh, post verdad in Spanish, uh, just a couple weeks ago. So my, my sinking feeling that I will not be able to completely sort out with you here today, but my sinking feeling as my book goes to press has been along the lines of what good is an actual fact, rendir se Hamas, and crip resistance more generally in the now officially named post-truth era. Um, I don't purport to have all the answers to those questions, uh, even if I do have a range of meditations uh, around those questions about other kinds of resistance besides or in addition to the heroic resistance of never surrendering or speaking truth to power. Uh, and let me pause and say that at my own university, um, uh, David Mitchell, uh, Sharon Snyder, uh, and 
other colleagues and I are, are planning our biennial uh, um, composing disability conference with a call for papers that just went out um, that is explicitly looking at crypt politics and the crisis of culture. Uh, it's not explicitly named crypt politics in a post-truth era because we want people to think about um, the crisis of culture in many historical periods and feel invited to, to reflect on that. Um, but uh, just to sort of, as I, as I meditate on resistance with you in the second uh, part of the paper here, I just want to note that that event will be happening in April 2018. So uh, quickly on resistance, this is the more theoretical part of the paper, um, thinking about resistance as a keyword. Resistance has arguably had uh, an uneven history of late in critical cultural theory, uh, perhaps especially in, in queer theory. Um, so I'm going to sort of survey some of the ways that uh, resistance has had a life in queer theory and disability theory and then give you some quick um, challenges or, or reversals. Um, but let me actually put something else besides Donald Trump on screen. Better, <laughs> better to have Liz Crow's sculpture on the, in the background as I talk about resistance. <laughs> um, for a time, a certain foundational uh, strand of queer theory indebted to the work of philosopher Michel Foucault um, has emphasized a theory of necessary or inevitable resistance. So famously, where there is power, there is resistance, Foucault wrote, and is doubtless the strategic codification of those points of resistance that makes a revolution possible. So as something that came to be called queer theory was congealing in, in the 1980s, uh, David Halperin was a key figure in, in spelling out what Foucauldian queer resistance could mean, uh, detailing in particular the ways that Foucault's work makes possible an understanding of power, not as always and everywhere repressive, but as productive. Halperin insisted at the time that the aims of an oppositional politics is not liberation, but resistance. So for Foucault and Halperin's, Halperin's reading, uh, dreams of liberation from repression uh, posited or imagined spaces outside of power and could not really grasp the insidious ways in which the very languages to which we are subjected, so languages of sexuality, for example, uh, materialize and secure specific ways of being and knowing and block inventiveness and creativity. Uh, does the expression, let us liberate our sexuality, have a meaning, Foucault asks, isn't the problem rather to try to decide the practices of freedom through which we could determine what is sexual pleasure and what are erotic, loving, passionate relationships with others? A focus, to shift to disability theory, a focus on practices of freedom that similarly generate new and inventive forms of intimacy and indeed even new and inventive forms of life has likewise characterized disability studies work on resistance. So the most foundational work in this vein, um, such as the essays collected in Shelley Tremaine's important edited collection Foucault and the Government of Disability, often pinpoints the ways in which the supposed truth of disabled lives is constituted diagnostically through the workings of what Foucault would term juridical power. Um, so fixed with a diagnosis, uh, disabled subjects are then reductively understood through and always and everywhere made to speak the truth of their patholo supposed pathology. Again, however, even as various forms of authority, especially medical authority, appear to be always and only negative or repressive, such encounters necessarily generate excessive subjects speaking otherwise. So Tremaine goes on to write that, quote, individuals and juridically constituted groups of individuals have responded to subjecting practices which are connected in increasingly intimate way and immediate ways to life by formulating needs and imperatives of that same life as the basis for political counter demands. That is, by turning them around into focuses of resistance. Resistant practices of freedom echo across or are made imperative in virtually all of the famous slogans of disability movements globally. So you know all this. If, if juridically constituted groups of disabled people are objectified by medical authority, pitied by non-disabled others in and through that objectification, and perhaps even encouraged and insisted in increasing numbers of locations to end their own lives, 
those constituted as such respond by saying nothing about us without us, piss on pity, assisted living, not assisted dying, uh, or, or this is what disability looks like, to pick a rallying cry that actually emerged directly from that 2012 Paralympic moment um, when uh, activists globally started to circulate other images of disability that countered what um, many were starting to call uh, cripspiration uh, and had long called inspiration porn. So the urgency of such counter demands, particularly as they individually and collectively reanimate those subjectified as disabled, underscores Halpern's point that, quote, such radicalism is not merely a radicalism for its own sake, a fashionable attachment to whatever may look new in the way of personal and political styles. Nonetheless, and this is where we turn to the, the problems with resistance of late uh, as a key word, as queer theory in particular has uh, flourished in the two decades since Halperin wrote Saint Foucault, uh, achieving in the process of that flourishing a sort of legible cachet um, and marketability in the academy uh, and in academic publishing, uh, which arguably thrives on what looks new um, uh, in relation to a range of intellectual and political styles, there is a certain congealing of resistance that perhaps could be described as radicalism for its own sake that has become evident. A well-intentioned critique of the mainstream LGBT movement's incorporation into state and capital has as its flip side a longing for a somewhat innocent figure of resistance. So in the, the, the section that um, follows the sort of introduction on here's what resistance has looked like in queer theory and disability theory, uh, I then complicated a bit by turning to um, a theorist in each location, uh, Bobby Benedicto in queer theory and Nirmala Aravelis uh, in, in disability theory. Um, and, and look at the ways in which both uh, make particular arguments around resistance that I find convincing, but then go on to critique. Um, so very briefly, Benedicto's uh, book, which is a fascinating study of Gay Manila called Under Bright Lights, um, questions the value of resistance in our moment um, because of the academic marketplace that I just uh, glossed, uh, which is always on the lookout for what he terms the most resistant figure. Uh, he lists them, the queer of color, the third world queer, the disabled queer, the working class queer, and the like that are invested with the potential for transgression by virtue of their exclusion and on whom faith is placed for a still radical politics. Um, so in my reading of Benedicto, uh, I, I point out that where the academic marketplace has, has in fact conjured up that sort of innocent, resistant figure, it's not actually resistant in the ways that queer and disability theory uh, argued resistance materialized uh, prior to the moment we're in. Aravelis, uh, on the other hand, uh, argues for a renewed attention to a collective resistance that um, I completely share uh, in that uh, we are both putting forward what could be understood as materialist books. Um, However, uh, my critique of Aravelis' call for an ongoing and reinvigorated uh, collective resistance uh, is a critique of the ways uh, in which um, her book uh, positions that collective resistance as against uh, what she terms sort of individualized, artistic, uh, 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 disabled work uh, that's often focused on by people in English departments. Um, and my quarrel uh, or quibble with the book is that especially in an age of austerity, we need all of the imaginative tools at our disposal uh, and that we need to be wary of a sharp division between sort of real work located in say the social sciences or education and more sort of frivolous uh, imaginative work such as artistic work of Crow, Radwanski and others. I don't think that it's Arabellus's intent at all um, but I think that that, part, that arguably participates in a sort of logic of austerity where we know this at universities that we work in where it's easier to sort of trim the humanities and that sort of frivolous stuff than it is to trim the disciplines that are supposedly doing real serious work. 
I think this is more of a problem actually uh, in another recent disability studies book, uh, which is Loneliness and Its Opposite, um, which is a great study of disabled sexuality in Scandinavia, Denmark and Sweden in particular, but does in the intro put forward this sharp divide between that, that work that literature professors are doing over here and the real work uh, that anthropologists in this case are doing over there. So, um, with that survey of resistance in the background, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude uh, thinking through again um, those problems of what do we do with uh, resistance in this very complicated uh, moment that we're in. And I'm, I'm going to do that by turning to the work of uh, another queer of color theorist, Dariak Scott. Um, uh, and I'll also briefly turn here in conclusion to the crip work of Corbett o O'Toole. Uh, and in turning towards O'Toole and Scott in conclusion, I'm suggesting that there, there are other alternatives legible in queer and disability theorizing in this particular moment uh, in the histories of the field, other alternatives to the, the, what I just said about Benedicto and Aravelis. Arguing that, quote, we shall need a literary imagination to supplement conventional forms of political resistance uh, or revolution, Dariak Scott advances in his amazing book, Extravagant Abjection, Blackness, Power, and Sexuality in the African American Literary Imagination. Uh, he advances a reading of bodily and mental distress in the work of Frantz Fanon that both affirms the need for a reservoir of resistance uh, in relation to the colonizers' acts of subjugation and enslavement and attempts to account for what is lost when uh, Aravelis like the complex workings of language and textuality are discounted. Scott's analysis in this great book is not explicitly crip, and yet his attention to wounded um, uh, bodies and minds, the, the bodies and minds of the Algerian revolution that he was literally tending, I would argue, has much to offer disability studies, especially in relation to resistance. Surveying the ways in which Fanon writes about his patients, Scott particularly attends to the ongoing metaphor of muscular tension. Fanon examines bodies that have been beaten down and broken by colonization and war and sees in those disabled bodies both the need for an active and ongoing resistance to colonization and the potential for that uh, active resistance. So, Basically, wounded, tense muscles for Fanon, uh, in Scott's reading of him, are indicative and anticipatory. So they, they indicate what colonialism and war have done, and they anticipate an active resistance by those same bodies to <coughs> colonial domination. Fanon can, in some ways, hopefully this is already clear, be aligned with Aravelis here, since she too focuses um, more than 50 years later on how disability is often caused by colonialism and capital, uh, capitalism. Like Fanon, moreover, Aravelis looks beyond language and textuality towards forms of active resistance that would counter those systems. Scott, however, while consistently acknowledging that the need to continue this pursuit of active resistance is clear, lingers over the language of objection, blackness, woundedness, discovering within it other forms of resistance. Paradoxically, in many ways that I would argue are exactly where the best queer and crip thought is at the moment, Scott reanimates resistance in and through abjection. So if Fanon moves quickly from literal and metaphorical broken bodies uh, and tense muscles to the robust self-endorsement that is ultimately, for, for Fanon, a form of black power, Derek Scott examines what is lost in that too hasty move, uh, the too hasty dismissal of what he sees as a conviviality of abjection, blackness, and woundedness. Although it's not at all his intent, Scott excavates an ableism that is inherent to Fanon's theory, and by extension, any theory that would conjure away the twisted contours of the literary imagination. Fanon's post-colonial subject cannot locate value in woundedness and brokenness. Resistance only emerges when that subject overcomes its linguistic relegation to abjection, blackness, and disability. Scott, however, pinpoints another form of resistance 
that is always in circulation around the resistance, power, and consciousness Fanon puts forward. The Fading Scars, to turn towards the title of Corbett O'Toole's recent memoir, Remain Scars for Scott. Um, and I'll just read this last paragraph on O'Toole and then conclude. Uh, we may have time for a couple questions. Um, O'Toole's memoir shows uh, an artwork by Sandy Yee on the cover that shows Sandy Yee's hands and some sort of white paint-like substance on it. Uh, it says, Corbett Joan O'Toole, Fading Scars, My Queer Disability History. So O'Toole's mem memoir, uh, and I would say queer disability thought in general at this moment, might be understood as performing in a different vein what Scott theorizes. Although O'Toole more explicitly combines Scott's literary imagination with the disability materialism of Aravellis. O'Toole writes, my scars define me. I have often wanted to host a scar camp where I can celebrate and mourn my scars with other disabled people, where being scarred is the norm, where we sing and paint and write and perform our scar stories. Scars remind me that the traumas of my past will always accompany me, faded as they may be. Scott would likely argue that um, Fanon does not value this form of resistance, uh, except as the sort of sketchy lineaments of, of a figure that's yet to be fully realized. Yet this scarred, wounded figure, a figure that's literally disabled but never named as such by Scott and, and many other queer theorists, uh, quote, this is for Scott, quote, possesses an intriguing quality, defeated, working within and saturated by the defeat that constitutes its foundation and the limits of its effectiveness, yet not defeated in such a way that it exceeds the defeat and takes on a powerfulness that the defeat does not quash or necessarily succeed, succeed in assimilating. Scott calls the resistance legible in brokenness, wounds, and scars extravagant abjection. Fading scars and extravagant objection, I argue, mark the point towards which queer crypt theory has now written itself, and paradoxically, perhaps, that excessive, abject, scarred site will continue to generate some of the most transformative work in these inescapably intertwined interdisciplinary fields at a time when we need, more than ever, the queer crypt resistance that has been simmering for four decades. Thanks. Um, but if I had more time, I would actually talk a little bit more about that, that vulnerability and vulnerability as a tender um, site of, of resistance. This is an image that some of you may know because it's from, it's a local image uh, of Kalia Franklin uh, on the beach uh, uh, in West Toy Lake, uh, not far from here. Um, the image shows, an, it's a nude self-portrait with her on a beach uh, in a sort of NHS issued wheelchair. Uh, it's called Left Out in the Cold, and she performed it uh, on a cold winter day. Um, you can see snow on the ground. Uh, her back is turned to us, and she's just lying on the beach. Um, this was uh, as the initial uh, austerity cuts were moving through the, the coalition government's parliament. Um, so I'm sort of using this image to kind of uh, uh, underscore what you're saying about vulnerability, and I, I find this image, and say in the book, about this image 
even more haunting now. There's no way that Franklin, at the time that she did this beautiful nude self-portrait, um, could have anticipated the global image of Alan Curdy dead on the beach um, that emerged a few years later. And yet, for me, the later image um, is now an image that I read alongside this image, especially when I think about the UK and the ways in which the vulnerable bodies in the UK that have been particularly targeted are disabled people and immigrants. Uh, Curdy did not die on the shores of the UK, but there has certainly been uh, an anti-immigrant sentiment for many people that has been absolutely intertwined with an anti-disabled uh, sentiment that's all about not accepting and embracing vulnerability. I just wanted to say very quickly, um, kind of given the centrality of racism in austerity politics, um, I think that the, the point you're making about objection in the way that there can, you know, that it can be possibly a basis for intersectional resistance is, is really important. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I um, sometimes uh, uh, Robin D. G. Kelly does cite disability, Derek Scott does not, um, Roderick Ferguson increasingly does. I'm amazed at the ways in which uh, sort of radical black thought and queer of color critique in particular um, dovetail with, with disability thought and theory. Um, so I cite Kelly because I think his notion of freedom dreams is a disabled notion uh, and I think that Scott's obviously Scott's extravagant objection for me is also a sort of crip notion um, and Ferguson increasingly in his work makes clear that he's reading disability theory and trying to integrate the two much more than almost anyone else in, in the field. I was interested in, um, you talked a little bit about affect and resistance and I was wondering like how much you considered the role of affect and resistance um, and I'm just asking because lately I've been doing more sort of like reflection on our own practices. So I'm involved in some political stuff in New Zealand mm -hmm. um, and looking at how the sort of the alt-right, if you call them, the way that they communicate with people is often like, we feel your problem, uh, we understand you, and here's a simple solution, it's the fault of the other. So it, be it like a Muslim or a Jew or, or whatever. Whereas um, on the, the left, if you want to call it, or the resistance movements, um, we often sort of go through a practice of like shaming people like Trump and Trump supporters and we kind of enact this almost an era of moral superiority and, and I sort of think of the role of affect in that that if people are amenable to listening to someone like Trump um, they're less likely to actually hear our message because of the role in affect and the way that we're communicating our message to people so I was just wondering how much you considered that. I think uh, David's giving me a sign that this needs to be really quick. <laughs> uh, um, I was, you know, sort of teasing out that distinction, which is a, a thin one between um, a politics of affect and an affective politics, uh, and Gould in particular trying to sort of use the ways in which AIDS activists um, did not necessarily have the language at the moment of the flourishing of AIDS activism uh, to register what she again calls non-conscious and unnamed uh, experiences of bodily energy and intensity that arise in response to stimuli impinging on the body. So that's where affect circulates for me in the book in that sort of Gouldian sense. Um, Trump, in my book, actually ultimately gets a footnote <laughs> because um, the book is, is basically bookended by, 20, it's 2011 to 2016 basically, and I footnote and say Trumpism was on the ascendancy as this book went to press uh, and future uh, works will have to grapple with what crip politics means in the Trump era. So I will be thinking a lot about the things that you're citing. Okay. Thank you.